Hello, welcome to the North Carolina Pharmacists Association webinar series. We appreciate your participation in this presentation titled Hepatitis C Virus Update 2019. Following the webinar, please be sure to follow the instructions alongside the webinar's link on the NCAP website to obtain CE. NCAP members will receive one hour of free NCCE credit. Our speaker today is Olga Klebanov. Uh, she is currently a professor of pharmacy at Wingate University School of Pharmacy. Her focus is HIV and hepatitis C, and her practice site is located in Charlotte. She is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and prior to joining Wingate, she spent five years teaching at Temple University in Philadelphia. She has presented at various national and international HIV conferences and has several publications focusing on HIV and hepatitis C related topics. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Amy, for the introduction. Um, today I will be speaking on hepatitis C virus for HCV. I'm giving you an update for 2019. Um, here on the slide, you'll see my objectives. I will first briefly describe the epidemiology, transmission, pathogenesis, and complications associated with chronic hepatitis C. I will highlight patient populations that should be screened for chronic HCV. We will then review the common adverse events, drug-drug interactions, and contraindications with anti-HCV agents focusing on the novel, direct-acting antivirals. I will describe the genotypic activity of novel anti-HCV oral drugs and their utility in the different populations um, of hepatitis C. I will also highlight the recommended treatment regimens for patients with HCV based on the most updated guidelines, and these will be coming mostly from AASLD. So the epidemiology of HCV, the World Health Organization, or WHO, estimates that there are over 185 million people infected with HCV around the world. About 350,000 people die each year from liver-related complications, and up to 75% of those infected are unfortunately still unaware of their infection. In the United States, based on the CDC, there are up to 4 million persons living with chronic hepatitis C. The highest prevalence is among persons born between 1945 and 1965, so we call these our baby boomers. This slide depicts the global prevalence of HCV. And as you can see, um, most of the hepatitis C burden, the highest burden is in Egypt, um, followed by countries in the Middle East as well as Asia. Here in the United States and North America, we have a relatively low prevalence of hepatitis C. And if you look at the reported number of acute hepatitis C cases between 2001 and 2016, and this is per the CDC, we're seeing a sharp rise in hepatitis C cases in the last um, eight years or so. If you're looking at hepatitis C incidence by age groups, we can see that the people that are most affected by this um, disease are the people in their 20s and 30s. And this is most likely due to the opioid crisis going on and injection drug use. If you're looking at all the people that are currently infected in hepatitis C in the United States, we see a lot of gaps in our practice. If you take in the whole pool of patients with hepatitis C, we know that about half of them are diagnosed and are aware of their infection. So unfortunately, half the people that have it don't even know their status. And of those patients, only a small proportion are actually treated and cured. And this is unfortunate because the regimens that we have now can achieve close to 100% cure rates. So if you capture more people, with hepatitis C and get them into care and have them treated, you'll have, um, you may reach the eventual goal of elimination of this virus. So the Department of Health and Human Services has set a goal for next year, for 2020, to increase the percentage of persons who are aware of their hepatitis C virus infection from 50 up to 66%. And so a lot of screening measures have been put in place and uh, advertised to providers to screen people for hepatitis C. 
how is this virus transmitted? I'm sure this is mostly a review for everyone. So through injection drug use is the most common route in the US. Um, receipt of donated blood and blood products as well as organs. This is rare in our country because we have screening that has been available since 1992 for different viruses. Needle stick injuries in healthcare settings as well as babies born to hepatitis C virus infected mothers. Um, Transmission through sex is not as frequent as IV drug use, but can happen. So sex with an HCV infected person, um, specifically MSMs, have an increased risk of sexual transmission. Sharing personal items contaminated with infectious blood, like razors and toothbrushes, is also not very frequent. And other healthcare procedures that involve invasive procedures, like injections, as well as unregulated tattooing. We know that we have a big opioid epidemic and crisis in the United States, and unfortunately this has led um, a rise in infections among um, children born to mothers with HCV. So the increase in new HCV infections um, is primarily among young white adults who uh, got HCV via injection drug use, and this has led to the increased transmission from mother to child. If we're looking specifically at North Carolina, we are one of the states with the highest increase of the incidence of hepatitis C infection among young persons who inject drugs. And these are data from the CDC um, between 2006 and 2012. If we think about the virus and drug targets, we know that it's a single-stranded RNA virus. It lacks proofreading polymerase, which enables very frequent viral mutations. It does replicate within our liver hepatocytes. And we have six major genotypes that have been identified so far. Uh, they're termed genotype one through six, with further subclassifications as 1A, 1B, and so forth and so on. So if you're looking at the virus and um, drug targets, and we know that the virus comes into the hepatocyte um, and after uncoding its RNA, it goes through various steps and eventually leading to virion assembly and transport and release. And more recently, we have identified um, several targets that can be targeted by drugs. So protease inhibitors, these are specific for hepatitis C, not to be confused with HIV PIs. So non-structural protein 3-4A protease inhibitors, um, non-structural protein 5A inhibitors, as well as non-structural 5B RNA polymerase inhibitors have all recently been approved by the FDA to treat hepatitis C. I mentioned that there are six major genotypes around um, the world. If you're looking at genotype distribution of HCV, it's interesting to note that it varies based on where the patient is living or is coming from. So if you're looking at this graph, the size of the circle indicates, um, I guess, the prevalence of people living with hepatitis C. So the bigger the circle, the more prevalent the virus is in that country. And then inside the circle is a pie chart depicting the genotype breakdown in the different countries. So we see that in North America, the most common genotype that we'll see is genotype one. So in red is genotype one, followed by genotype two, three, and four. If you look at other parts of the world, however, for example, places like Egypt, um, in Africa, we have genotype four being the most prevalent one uh, there. And if you're looking at Asia, genotype three is more common in those countries um, as well as in the Middle East as well. Um, so we have to take into account where the patient is coming from. Um, we have a lot of migration going on here and test people um, for which genotype to have so that we can tailor their treatment a little bit better. The clinical presentation of hepatitis C, it's typically asymptomatic. Um, hepatitis C RNA will be detectable within a couple of weeks of exposure. Patients may present with some mild and nonspecific symptoms like fatigue, anorexia, weakness, and jaundice. Um, about a third of the patients may have these nonspecific symptoms. 
Almost all infected patients will develop antibodies to hepatitis C, and about 15% of patients will clear hepatitis C virus on their own, but 85% of people will go on to develop chronic hepatitis C virus. And this is defined as persistently detectable HCV RNA for at least six months. Um, the most common symptom is going to be persistent fatigue, but as patients progress to advanced disease throughout the years, um, they may develop hepatomegaly, stigmata of liver disease like spider nevi, splenomegaly, and other symptoms. And on the liver biopsy, there will be some degree of necroinflammation, which may result in fibrosis, which will eventually lead to cirrhosis. So chronic hepatitis C is a progressive disease. This happens over many, many years. So patients will go from a healthy liver to some fibrosis development to cirrhosis. And in the meantime, they will have few or no symptoms for many decades. And the main complications we really want to avoid include hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC, end-stage liver disease or ESLD, cirrhosis, transplantation, and of course, death. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about screening for hepatitis C. Um, we talked about the baby boomers. One-time screening is recommended for anyone born between 19, 1945 and 1965, even if they really don't have any other risk factors for hepatitis C. And a one-time screening is recommended for anyone with certain risk factors, for example, IV drug use, uh, long-term dialysis, receiving a tattoo in an unregulated facility, healthcare workers if they have had accidental exposure, children born to anti-HCV positive mothers, um, history of transfusions before 1992, um, patients who have been incarcerated in the past, anyone with HIV infection, and chronic liver disease of unknown cause, or if they have elevated liver enzymes. So this is just a one-time screening. However, if someone has um, current IV drug use going on, or if the patient is an HIV-infected MSM, um, it is recommended that these populations get annual screening. So if you're looking at prevalence of hepatitis C antibody positivity in our country, um, if you look at the year of birth, you'll see a big spike in anyone born um, in the years of the baby boomers. So that's why we have the recommendations to test anyone born between 1945 and 65. Let's say you get the lab results back. How do we interpret them? Um, if you check an HCV, HCV antibody and it is negative or non-reactive, you can assume that there has been no prior exposure to hepatitis C. However, if you suspect a recent exposure, um, you want to also test for the viral load, the hepatitis C viral load, because it does take a few months to develop the antibodies. If you have someone who has an antibody positive result or reactive, that means that they've had prior or current exposure to hepatitis C, and it requires further evaluation. So for these patients, you wanna check a hepatitis C viral load to see if it's detectable. So someone who has this HCV antibody reactivity, if you check an HCV RNA level and it comes back negative, that means that this patient has had prior HCV infection and either they're one of those 15% of patients that resolved it on their own, or they have previously received successful treatment and achieved a cure. If the patient has a positive antibody and their viral load is detectable, that means that they have current and active infection and most likely uh, need to be treated. So these are the treatment recommendations um, from the current guidelines. The goal of therapy is to reduce all-cause mortality and liver-related health adverse consequences, including ESLD and HCC. And we do this by achieving a virologic cure, um, also termed SVR12. So this is sustained virologic response 12 weeks after the end of treatment. So after the patient finishes treatment, they come back 12 weeks later, 
and you recheck an HCV RNA, and if it's still undetectable, those patients are thought to have a cure, so SVR12. Who should initiate treatment? It is thought that all patients with chronic HCV should be treated unless the patient has a very short life expectancy, um, then they may not be a candidate. There are some recommended assessments prior to initiation of therapy. Um, you wanna evaluate and stage their liver disease to determine if the patient has advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis because they will be treated a little bit differently. So a liver biopsy can be done, but that's very invasive and it's not frequently performed anymore. Um, imaging or non-invasive serum markers can be used as well to stage the patient. A lot of times we'll stage the fibro fibrosis based on stages zero through four. So fibrosis zero or F0, F1 and F2 are thought to be lower levels of fibrosis. And then F3, F4, F3 is thought to be advanced fibrosis and F4 is cirrhosis. So anyone with F3 and F4, um, those patients have more advanced liver disease. We also wanna check their CBC, INR, LFTs, all the typical tests at baseline, as well as HCV genotype and subtype, um, their HCV viral load or RNA, and to see if they're also co-infected with hepatitis B, um, because that will need to be taken into account as well. In some situations for certain drugs, we'll also test the baseline drug resistance um, to see if they need a longer duration of therapy or an addition of ribavirin. And we wanna evaluate any potential drug-drug interaction. I'll touch on this briefly um, in a little bit, but there is a helpful resource that I like to use, and it's um, out of the Liverpool website, and it's hep-druginteractions.org. I like this slide because it demonstrates very nicely how far we have come in the last 27, 28 years or so. So with current oral therapies, we can achieve over 95% rates of cures um, in patients. And the regimens are very easy to tolerate. They're oral, they're short in duration. Um, very low pill burden and very few adverse events. However, if you look back just a few years ago, um, very, very low response rates with therapies that were very difficult to tolerate and had to be given um, for a long time, most of the time up to a year of treatment. So we went from a 6% cure rate to a over 95% cure rate in more than two decades. And I think that's great progress. So today we're mostly gonna focus on the oral therapies, the direct acting antivirals or DAAs. So the approved DAAs come from multiple different classes um, and they are the basis for the backbone of our combination hepatitis C regimens these days. And if you're looking at the uh, viral RNA um, components, we know that we have a protease that we can inhibit with NS3 protease inhibitors. And I've listed them here for you. They are grosoprevir, peritoprevir boosted with ritonavir, semeprevir, voxaleprevir, and glucaprevir. Um, and then the NS5A inhibitors include the cladosphere, elbosphere, lidiposphere, and bidosphere, velcatosphere, and fibrentosphere. We have the NS5B nucleoside inhibitors. There's only one, sofosfavir. And we have the NS5B non-nucleoside inhibitors, which is the Sabavir. So just to let you know that the long names also have abbreviations associated with them. So I would refer to this slide if you need to, um, because I will use a lot of abbreviations in the upcoming slides. So how do we tell which class of drugs these drugs are in? Um, there is a trick to it. So for NS3 for a protease inhibitor, the names, if the name contains a PR in the middle, um, it tells you that that is a protease inhibitor. So for example, glucaprevir, grisoprevir, all of these have the PR in the middle. Um, it's an NS5B polymerase if it has a B in the middle of the word, so sofosbuvir, disabuvir, 
these are NS5B drugs. And if there's an A in the middle, then it's an NS5A inhibitor. So it's a cladosphere, elbosphere, lodiposphere. All of these have ASVR um, at the end of their name. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the first line recommended drugs um, for hepatitis C patients. And these are all going to be combination products. Um, these are fixed dose combinations. I'm going to focus on five. They are um, Cefaspivir Lodiposphere, which makes up Harvoni, Cefaspivir Velpatosphere, which makes up Eclusa. Then there's a triple combo called Cefaspivir Velpatosphere Voxaleprevir, which is Vosevi. Um, there's Glicaprevir Pibrentosphere, or Mabaret, and this comes as a um, three pills once a day regimen. And Elbosphere Grozaprevir is Zepatir. And a lot of these are packaged in an easy, simple way for patients um, for blister packs, or um, these come just as bottles. So just to go over their PK properties, just overall, um, think of all of these drugs as well-absorbed. Um, you can take all of them with or without food. Um, they're all one pill a day, except for Mavaret, which is three tablets, but still once a day. All of these agents are gonna be highly protein bound. Um, most of them are going to have a lot of cytochrome P450 metabolism. So you'll have to screen patients for drug-drug interactions. Um, all of them except for cefospivir will be eliminated uh, via the biliary and um, feces. Cefospivir is the only one that is renally eliminated, but remember that it is included in three of these drugs. So three of these agents, will, you'll not be able to use them in um, renal impairments, so patients with less than 30 mils a minute for creatinine clearance or dialysis, whereas these two you can use in those patients. As far as half-life, all of them have a long enough half-life to be administered once a day. So that's kind of like a um, quick summary of their PK properties. These are gonna be liver drugs for the most part, um, very well absorbed, and you need to screen for drug-drug interactions. Um, they also differ in the genotypes that they're active against. So if we look at um, Grozaprevir elbosphere, it's only active against genotypes one and four, Cefaspivir lodiposphere, one, four, five, and six, and then the other three are actually pangenotypic drugs. So they can be used in patients with any of the genotypes, one through six. All of these regimens will give you a cure rate of greater than or equal to 95%. Okay, so AASLD has recommendations for patients who are um, DAA naive. And I tried to summarize these recommendations in one slide instead of having multiple slides for each genotype and then cirrhosis status. So I'm going to orient you to this slide. You have the genotypes listed on the left column. So one, two, three, four, and then five and six together. Duration of treatment and regimen in these four columns. Um, so non-cirrhotic patients are gonna fall into this area right here. And then patients who have compensated cirrhosis are going to be described here, the treatments for those patients. And then if the patient has um, renal insufficiency, so GFR less than 30, those recommendations are gonna be in the very last two columns of the slide. So if you're looking at genotype one, um, the recommended treatments are cefospivir lodiposphere or glucaprovir vibrentosphere for eight weeks. Um, so soft lead, um, can be given for eight weeks as long as the patient is non-black, HIV non-infected, and has a low viral load uh, for hepatitis C less than six million. Otherwise, they would get 12 weeks of treatment. And then you can also give grozoprevir elbosphere or cefaspivir velpatosphere for 12 weeks. So this is non-cirrhotics. If they have compensated cirrhosis, you can give any of those regimens I just mentioned 
but the duration has to be 12 weeks. You cannot give it for eight weeks and compensate its cirrhosis. And if they have renal insufficiency, your only two options are Gleepib, so Glecapravir, Pib Regisphere, as well as Grozapravir, Elbosphere. And um, the duration is eight to 12 weeks. So if they're non cirrhotics they can get eight weeks. But if they have cirrhosis, you need to give them 12 weeks of Gleepib. And for Grozapravir, Elbosphere, it's 12 weeks, regardless of the cirrhosis status. I'm not gonna go into detail on the rest of the genotypes because most of the time you're gonna see genotype one, um, but you'll have the recommendations here for your reference if you need to look at them. Okay, so we just talked about patients who are treatment naive, and now we're gonna switch to people who are treatment experienced. So if they've had hepatitis C treatment in the past, and on this slide, I broke it down once again by genotype and then different experience with different drugs. So patients who've had prior experience with just peg interferon and ribavirin are listed here. And this is their duration. And then patients who've had prior DAAs and failed, so that 5% of people that failed DAAs um, the first time can actually be retreated. And those patients will also have a greater than 95% success rate. So these patients will be subdivided into what type of DAAs they've had in the past. So either an NS34 only or NS5B inhibitor, sofosbuvir without an NS5A, for example, or an NS5A inhibitor plus minus an NS34A protease inhibitor or an NS5B inhibitor. So we have to kind of stage the patient based on what they've had in the past. And then the duration is on the very last column. So almost straight for Grozapavir, Elbosphere, soft lead for genotype 1A only, and then Sofvel for 12 weeks. If they've had prior DAA experience, um, you can give them, there's lots of different options based on what they've had. Um, if they've had the Sofosbuvir in the past, you do wanna use either Sofvel, Vox, the triple combo, Bostevi, if they have genotype 1A. You can use Gleepib, or you can use just the Sofvel uh, for genotype 1B. If they've had a NS5A plus or minus NS3, 4 protease inhibitor, or an NS5B, um, then you do have to give them the triple combo soft valve box for 12 weeks. And these patients will still um, have very good response rates of over 95%. So if the patient has genotype um, three, four, five, and six, and they've had prior DAAs, your only option really is gonna be the triple combination of soft bell box um, for 12 weeks. This drug is pangenotypic, and it's um, shown to have very good activity in patients who failed prior DAAs. What about some of the common warnings and precautions? There's really not too many. Um, some of the ones I wanted to highlight are the low creatinine clearance with any drug that has sofosbuvir in it, so soft, sofosbuvir latiposphere, sofosbuvir velpatosphere, and um, sofosbuvir velpatosphere voxileprevir. And um, another one is decompensated cirrhosis. So any combination that has a protease inhibitor included in it, so such as grozaprevir, that's a protease, um, glucaprevir is a protease, as well as voxileprevir, that's another protease inhibitor. Those drugs um, are not recommended in decompensated cirrhosis. You can still use them in cirrhosis, just not patients who have decompensated cirrhosis. They've shown to make liver disease even worse. So you wanna avoid those drugs in these types of patients. So how do we distinguish between these um, top four recommended options. We look at it as far as dosing, they're all gonna be once a day. Um, Gleepib or Maverit 
is the only one that's three tablets once a day. Um, all the other ones are one pill once a day. We want to look at the genotypes that they're active against. So, uh, for example, Elbospheric rosaprevir, only one or four, whereas some of the other ones are going to be ping and genotypic, so one through six, for example, Gleepib and Softvel. Um, we want to look at whether or not they require resistance testing or if you can use them in CKD, as well as looking at the drug drug interaction potential. And so, this is how we tailor patients' therapies. We also, of course, have to take into account their insurance coverage to see which ones are preferred on their insurance plan and which ones you may have to do a prior authorizations on if they need, if they need it. So let's touch on drug-drug interactions with DAAs. Um, drug interactions can happen via different mechanisms, as we, guys, as we know. So these drugs have P450, interactions to keep in mind. Some of them are glucuronidated. Um, drug transporters play a big role in these drugs metabolism and absorption as well as protein binding. And so oh, we don't want to forget our transporters. So most of the DAAs will be affected by drug transporters which can affect their absorption and um, basically also their drug-drug interactions with other drugs. So this can happen in your intestines, in your kidneys, as well as in your liver. I used a uh, very useful source. So the European Hepatitis C Practice Guidelines have very nice tables that they've published in their most recent version of the guidelines. And I will refer you to them here at the bottom of the page as a reference. They have nice tables between DAAs and commonly used drugs in hepatitis C virus infected patients. So this first slide is gonna be talking about our HIV medications, so antiretrovirals. In general, um, if you're looking at the DAAs and ARVs, we'll see that NRTIs are typically safe to give with DAAs. Um, there's very little drug-drug interaction potential to worry about. However, our NNRTIs, our PIs, as well as anything that's given with a booster is gonna have a greater potential for a DDI. So some of the um, integrase inhibitors that are more safe to use that will lack any kind of risk for DDIs will be the INSTEs that are glucuronidated and have minimal P450 metabolism. So those are going to be the dolutegravir um, and the raltegravir. Um, all the other ones you kind of have to see when watch what exactly you're using it with um, to see you know how you can alter their therapy. Um, drugs of abuse, you know we hope that patients are not going to be abusing drugs while they're on hepatitis C medication. So most of these um, don't really have a lot of issues. Lipid lowering drugs, a lot of our patients are going to be older and have concomitant disease states. So if they do have lipid issues and they're on statins, um, you want to try and use the ones that have minimal P450 metabolism and also try and go with like the lower dose um, of, the medic of the statin that you possibly can while you're using DEAs. In some cases, it may even be okay to hold the statin while the patient takes their hepatitis C therapy, since it's only eight to 12 weeks, so very short term. But if it's not possible to hold the statin, you wanna make sure that it's one of the um, less interacting ones, such, such as pravastatin. Um, some of our patients will be on different CNS drugs. For the most part, there's very little issues, unless you're talking about, again, drugs that are heavily metabolized by the P450, such as um, quetiapine. And also when you put it together with a drug that has a protease inhibitor in it, such as the um, peritaprevir combination with umbitosphere. If patients have um, some heart issues and have to take cardiovascular drugs, we have to watch out for um, drugs like amiodarone, which is known to have drug interactions with other medications, um, and some of these other ones that you may run into. But overall, um, 
there are ways that you can tailor their therapy um, for their cardiovascular disease if they have to be on hepatitis C drugs for a couple of months. Looking at antiplatelet and anticoagulants, um, unfortunately, a lot of our oral novel anticoagulants are going to have issues with these medications because of their met metabolic pathways. Um, so warfarin has problems, um, dabigatran, especially when they're given with anything that contains a PI. So peritaprevir, voxaleprevir, um, glucaprevir, these are all protease inhibitors. And just like with the HIV protease inhibitors, your hep C protease inhibitors will have similar issues as far as drug check interactions. Um, patients who have undergone liver transplant um, are actually also candidates to receive hepatitis C therapy if they were not treated for hep C prior to their transplant. And so if they happen to be on immunosuppressants, um, most of them we can manage as far as dosing and monitoring goes. Um, and so always make sure to look up the package insert and the FDA label, as well as some of these useful um, websites that I'll give you at the end. So once the patient has been treated, um, how do we follow the patient? Um, most of the time, the guidelines will say that you really don't need any additional testing. However, if there, you see that their ALT is increasing, that you may want to check them again for um, hepatitis C viral load. If the patient has no or very moderate fibrosis, so anywhere from F0 to F2, if they don't have any other risks um, and no other comorbidities, they really don't need to be continuously monitored as far as their hepatitis C status goes. Um, remember that even once you cure the patient, the antibody for HCV will remain positive for most patients. Um, reinfection can also occur, so if they have repeated risk factors, uh, repeat, risk, risky behaviors, um, you may have to recheck them again and um, to check to see if they've been reinfected. So just as a summary as far as screening for hep hepatocellular carcinoma, if they have um, advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, so F3 to O4, those patients really cannot be discharged from the practice, so they need ultrasounds every six months to screen for HCC. However, if they have minimal um, or no fibrosis at baseline, they don't need to be screened for HCC long term. So just to summarize and conclude, um, we still have a lot of gaps in practice as far as HCV diagnosis and treatment is concerned. And there's a need for increased screening of baby boomers in high-risk populations. The opioid epidemic is unfortunately playing a major role in transmission of HCV in the younger population. Newer therapies that we discussed, or the DAAs, can achieve over 95% SVR12 rates in most patient populations. We as pharmacists will have an important role in screening for DDIs in patients with HCV. And just because someone clears HCV does not necessarily mean that they reverse their liver damage if they have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. And so those patients in particular will need to have continued monitoring for the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So here I've listed some very useful resources. Um, the ASLD guidelines get updated anytime there are any new data that have been published. So it's always useful to just go straight to the guidelines to see what the most recommended treatments are. Um, the European HCV practice guidelines, this is where those useful DDI tables came from. Here's a link to them. The CDC keeps updated data on and statistics on HCV in the United States. And then this is a nice website to screen um, for drug-drug interactions. So this is out of Liverpool, and it's hep-druginteractions.org. Um, so in closing, I have enjoyed providing this webinar for the North Carolina Association of Pharmacists. I hope you have found the content to be informative. And to receive continuing education, please follow the instructions provided for this webinar on the NCAP website. Thank you for your participation. <laughs>